Welcome to another Hollywood Times Live with your host, Susan Sweetser. ready to go. All right. Welcome everyone to the Hollywood Times Live. I'm your hostess Susan Sweetser and we have a couple of really special guests tonight. My special guest is iconic photographer and one of Los Angeles's most hundred interesting people, Jimmy Steinfeld. Say hey Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy. Hey, Susan. There you go. All right. Good night, Gracie. Uh, and Jimmy's special guest is the wonderful Greg Richley from The Wallflowers. And if you don't know who The Wallflowers are, you should. It's uh, actually Jacob Dylan's band. So, and, and you played with some other pretty incredible people. But, I have. Um, we are showing some of Jimmy's iconic photographs, some that he selected for this show. I, I love this one of ZZ Top. It's in their purple suits. <laughs> thank you, Susan. And uh, to everybody listening, I want to thank you, Susan, for having me as your guest tonight. And I want to thank my good friend, Greg Richling, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Us. Thank you both for being here. So, all right. I know you've been asked this question a thousand times, so consider this 2001. What made you decide to view life through a camera lens? Well, that's a good question. Uh, there's a couple stages, uh, speaking of on stage behind you there, there's a couple stages of uh, how that came about. Uh, stage number one was I graduated college and I wanted to travel around the country and see America. Um, mm. I, I hadn't seen a lot of the United States uh, as a kid, I hadn't done that much traveling. And uh, so I just took off in my car after college. And I knew that one day I'd want to be able to look back at that trip, that historic trip, and have some tangible uh, memories mm -hmm. other than just in my head. So I bought right. my first camera. That's the reason I bought my, and, and it's right here. Here it is. <laughs> All these years later, All right. my Minolta, my $100 camera. <laughs> so that's reason number one. Now, eventually, soon after that trip, I started to take my camera to rock and roll concerts just for fun and um, really outdoor shows because, you know, you had uh, uh, natural lighting. Uh, indoors, right. it was tough. I didn't know how to shoot indoors with, uh, you know, insufficient light. But Kodak came out with a special film in the early 80s that allowed you to take pictures in low light. And I used that film for the first time, I remember, and had great success. And that was sort of where I decided, hey, this is really fun and it's cool. And I'm going to pursue this as, at least at that point, as a very active hobby. And then right. grew into a profession. Is that when you shot Stevie Nicks? Was, yes. was she the first the one first you, concert you concert. actually used that film with? You must have read my book. <laughs> we talk about that in the book. Um, the very first concert that I photographed with that film was the Stevie Nicks concert. The opening act, by the way, was one of my all-time favorite guitar players, Joe Walsh. Hmm. Yeah. So I actually, photo I actually <laughs> photographed him before her because he was opening the show. I hadn't thought ah. about that. But in any event... <laughs> When I got the pictures back and they turned out good with this film I had never used, I said, hey, this, I think this is going to work. Right. So, um, that was an important uh, event, so to speak. And, um, and then eventually uh, industry people saw me at just about every concert and they started to hire me and uh, then it really became a full-time profession. Right. And then, and then I want to ask Greg something. First of all, how did you meet Jimmy and become you know, friends? Jimmy has always been one of those guys, you know, kind of that's around because he's done so many shows. And in fact, um, what's kind of coincidental and funny about the photo um, in his second book of Fiona Apple, of which, you know, I wrote my story um, about uh, Fiona in, in his book, Rock and Roll Fans. Mm. Um, she actually was opening for my band 
uh, that concert that he took that photo, she was the opening act at the Universal Amphitheater when, when the Wallflowers were playing. Ah. Uh, so, you know, Jimmy, uh, he, he's photographed us even when we were out, even before that with Chris Isaac in 1995. Um, you know, I, I, I would see him at, at different uh, gallery showings. You know, I think Jimmy, I think we saw each other at the Jim Marshall um, Diltz uh, yes. uh, yeah. at the Morrison when the Morrison was on Sunset. So, you know, Jimmy's, Jimmy's uh, you know, kind of just, you know, he's a fixture and he's so great at, at what he does that, you know, all my friends know him. It's, it's even hard to remember the first time I met him. It's sort of just, I feel like I've always <laughs> known Jimmy. <laughs> I understand. I'm going to interject something, if I may. Please. So uh, recently, Greg and I were trying to figure out when did we actually meet? You know, I mean, uh, I had photographed Greg mm -hmm. before I ever knew him because I mm -hmm. photographed and he was uh, suggesting that a second ago mm -hmm. because I photographed the wallflowers uh, back in, Greg, what were we talking about 1995 or something like that? I wow. think you're probably referring to like the Troubadour shows that might've been around like 96. Yeah, Wow. okay. Yeah. Um, so here I, it turns out I actually photographed him before I really knew him. Right. But uh, because the other day we were talking about where did, when did we really like meet? So I went and I checked my emails. <laughs> and I think here's what I found. I'm an archeologist. This is some archeology span mm -hmm. I was doing. Um, I found an email that shows that you, Greg, requested that I be a, a contact on LinkedIn mm. five years ago. Okay. So that, th does that sound like maybe when- I think we had met each other, you know, during, I, I remember during the Chris Isaac, you know, because you have some of those backstage yeah, you know, shots of us. Weird. I think, you know, it was one of those things where I'd seen him and he photographed so many shows but it was probably about five, six years ago that we kind of started to hang out and, you know, go to lunch and kind of turn it into more of like a, a friendship. But yeah. the first time I met him was probably 25 years ago. And then, yeah, about maybe five, six years ago, we, um, we took it further <laughs> and became friends, uh, <laughs> hanging out in person. Yeah. Depth, huh? yeah. Now, let me just uh, conclude that little part by saying, uh, my second book, I'll show it off a little bit here. Please do. My I second well. book with <laughs> Angus Young on the cover, you can see it. Yes. Mm -hmm. ACDC. Um, when I came out with my second, my first book, I tell all the stories that go with my photographs in the first book. They're right. direct stories about how I met various uh, famous musicians and so forth. But in the second book, I said, I've already told my story. And I thought, yeah. I don't know what I'll do. I'm going to call friends of mine in the industry and see if they would tell a story. So in the second wow. book, I have 50 photographs of famous musicians. And I asked good friends like Greg Richling mm -hmm. to tell a story about someone in the book. And obviously, uh, Greg chose to write a story about Fiona Apple. And maybe you want to tell a little bit uh, sort of condense the beautiful long story you told yeah. about working with her and knowing her. Yeah, um, well, I guess, uh, yeah, we can save uh, the, the audience when they, when they purchase your book, then they can, they can read it word for word. <laughs> but I will condense it if I can, which is just that um, I had the good fortune of meeting Fiona Apple around that same time, 1995, when I was recording the second Wallflowers record Mm -hmm. at Jackson Brown Studio in Santa Monica Groove Masters. And I had finished recording for the day or something, you know, the afternoon. And my manager at the time, Andrew Slater, said, hey, come out to my car. I want you to hear this, this demo. I have a, a young, you know, female artist that uh, somebody gave me their tape. And it's just incredible. So I went and sat in his Mustang and he popped this three song piano vocal demo in and proceeded to play songs like Shadow Boxer. And I think Carry On was another one, um, wow. Slow Like Honey. And I was just completely floored by it, you know? And, you know, she sounds sort of wise beyond her years. I didn't know at the time, you know, until I went in the studio, you know, she was 17 years old. And, yeah. um, you know, 
so I was, I said to Andy, wow, you know, this, this girl's incredible. I mean, these lyrics are unbelievable. And it's, you know, this sultry kind of, you know, jazzy voice. And, and uh, he's like, great, I'm, I'm happy you like her. You're going in the studio with her next week. <laughs> so I went down to Four Street Recording <laughs> Studios in Santa Monica, about, you know, maybe 10 blocks from the studio that I was, I, I was at at the time, about a week later. And uh, myself and drummer Danny Frankel, who's played with everybody from Lou Reed to Katie Lang, um, and Patrick Warren, the keyboard player who did a lot with Michael Penn um, and has since, you know, played with everyone. Um, mm -hmm. He came into play and the three of us uh, worked with her on about three songs. It, uh, at the time, it became apparent that this was her first time ever playing with other musicians in her entire life. Wow. Um, her father was an actor, like a stage actor. Uh, she grew up in New York. And she was, you know, kind of, you know, one of these girls that had a piano in the room and kind of wrote for herself and, but hadn't been out performing. So literally um, those takes that we got that um, all of them actually ended up on the record, they couldn't beat the demos, mm -hmm. um, were her first time ever playing with other musicians. And I think that created something unique because um, we weren't going to tell her, hey, you know, lay off the left hand, I'll handle that on the bass. It was like, you can't really do that with somebody that hasn't hadn't played with anybody yet. So, yeah. um, so we found a way to kind of maneuver around what she did and, and be supportive. Um, and I think in that process, it kind of created an interesting style in, in and of itself. Um, so, you know, as I say in the book, you know, I'm, I'm, I was just really happy to be a part of her uh, early career uh, when she was starting out. I did a, subsequently after we did the album, I did a European tour with her before I had to go back to the Wallflowers. And, and um, you know, so that's wow. why I chose her, yeah. Well, how wonderful of you to, to be supportive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, Collaboration is certainly a great part of music. It helps really make it what it is. <clears throat> and for, excuse me, for, for someone like you and, and your other colleagues to just say, okay, we're gonna work with her. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not coming in here to, to rewrite, you know, her stuff. That's really wonderful. So yeah. thank you very much for that. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was, uh... You know, you have to be encouraging. And I'm, granted, she was a, a real talent already, right? She'd already, she had that voice and the piano style and the right. lyrics. Um, I just think that, you know, when, when you recognize that level of talent, it, it kind of becomes, how do I, like you said, you know, how do I get behind this and, you know, make it as, as good as it can be? Um, mm. Obviously, you know, that worked out and then she took it even further and, is uh, known for being a real, you know, true artist who she only puts albums out when she's ready and she has 10 songs that she feels really good about. Yeah. Uh, never really repeats, you know, so far, she's about five albums in. She's never really repeated working with the same producer. Um, she changes musicians quite a bit, you know, periodically someone will reappear, but very rarely. She's right. really, uh, she's a real, She's the real deal. <laughs> you know. Okay, so who would you like to play with or would you have liked to play with, but you haven't? Wow. Yeah, I know, it's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, well, the funny thing is, you know, I'm, I, I take this as mainly about, you know, Jimmy's career here, but, you know, my, my career's taken a, on a lot of different paths in, in, in that, you know, I was in the Wallflowers for 20 years and then left and I started producing on the film and TV side, which is actually what I went to university for. So ah. I've, I've been jumping around different professions over the last seven years, mm -hmm. um, mainly settling on, you know, producing on, on the film side documentaries. Um, but in terms of playing with different people, um, gosh, I mean, wouldn't it have been amazing to be able to play with Jimi Hendrix and be one of those lucky few like Dave Mason was and yeah. Rocky, the percussionist, you know, it, I think, um, you know, that kind of freedom in a trio setting of being able to kind of Right. Something you well, I want to get back to your story about what you've been, how you've been spending your time during the pandemic. But I'd really love Jimmy to comment on this photo. I love this photo. Yeah. 
we're looking at the uh, Dylan Petty photo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. So that photo was taken maybe in 85, 86, somewhere in there. And it was the tour, uh, it was uh, three bands on the road together. Bob Dylan, The Grateful Dead, and wow. Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Pretty cool tour, huh? Wow. So when they came to Minneapolis, they played at the Metrodome, which holds about 50,000 people. And um, on that tour, uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, of course, opened all the shows. But every other night, uh, Dylan would be the headliner. And then the next night, the Dead would be the headliner. And this would go back and forth. But Dylan's band were the Heartbreakers. So that was really cool. And then that's when I took this picture. And this picture mm. is very special to me for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's the very first time I photographed Bob Dylan, who's certainly one of my most famous artists, also a fellow Minnesotan. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but also that, that was, it was my, it was, I think my second photo in Rolling Stone magazine. And anytime I get a photo in Rolling Stone, you know, that's been pretty cool and important oh, yeah. to my career. So it, that, that picture is important for at least those two reasons. And of course, it's in my book, Rock and right. Roll Lens. And it's part of my limited edition uh, series. Um, and uh, Which people can, can get from your website, correct? Absolutely. Uh, you could- JimmySteinfeld.com. Uh, I'll make a beautiful limited edition print of this picture and any of the pictures in my book, there's 50 uh, pictures in the Rock and Roll Lens Volume 1. Um, and I might also mention that it's true you can order those from me at jimmysteinfeld.com, but my photographs are in several prestigious galleries, which I'm very proud of, around the United States. And one's coming up in a minute, so yeah. Yeah, okay, you mean one of those pictures is. So I'll yes. just mention them really quickly where you could go actually see uh, framed limited edition signed prints of mine. Number one, here in Los Angeles on Sunset Boulevard, across the street from the Guitar Center at Mr. Music Head, outstanding gallery. My picture of Guns N' Roses is there. Mm. Yeah. And at the uh, Gray Horse Gallery in Santa Monica, my picture of uh, the Eagles. The and, Eagles, all right. and here we are. All right, I'll talk about that picture in a second. Please. And also my picture of the Stones, the one and only Rolling Stones. Mm. Uh, that's at Gray Horse in Santa Monica. And then a very special uh, limited edition print, a gigantic print that I made of Prince, another Minnesotan um, mm. of blessed memory. And that's at the Jimmy Wilson Gallery in Minneapolis. Uh, so that's a big part of most photographers' uh, lives and careers are sure. um, limited edition prints and books and so forth. Now, this picture of the Eagles is interesting because it's the only time I ever photographed them. And they're really probably the number one band that I grew up with. So when they came to Minneapolis, uh, then I guess the uh, mid 90s or whenever it was, um, that was pretty exciting because I had never photographed them and I'd always loved them. And I wanted to get really good pictures. So I did mm. something I basically never do. I went and I rented a very expensive, enormous long lens. I, I own a long lens, every photographer, but I needed a gigantic one to get that close up. And um, so without that renting that lens for the day, I wouldn't have gotten such a good picture. And um, uh, so there you go. That's the Eagles, uh, one of our great bands, I would say of all time. Wouldn't you agree, yeah. Greg? One of the great bands, yeah. and, and and an all-time selling band. Uh, in, yeah. In the yeah. Uh, I think they have. <laughs> the, I think they have the, the 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 biggest sellers of all time. I tend to like the countryside the best of the Eagles. Mm. If I were to say, um, you know, I have a preference in their catalog. The like Desperado, and you know, um, you know, that kind of thing. Very yeah. Good. Well, I just uh, I, this is this would be a perfect shot for a caption contest because you really have to wonder <laughs> what mm -hmm. 
what made Timothy B. Schmidt so mad at John Felder? Oh, it's <laughs> the documentary? Everyone, everyone has a very different expression. And yeah. what a magic moment to have caught. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> but they only did this right. uh, particular move or song, you know, uh, there because usually Don is behind the drums. So he's right. out there playing <laughs> Telecaster. So didn't have a lot of time to get this shot. So I'm right. glad I did. Yeah. Yeah. It's special. It's special. And this one is at which gallery in Santa Monica? This is at the Gray Horse Gallery in Santa Monica, California. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's there right now, framed. <laughs> you can walk in, buy it from the gallery uh, exhibitor and bring it home and hang it on your wall. So you, yeah. it's good to go. There's Cheryl. Yeah. <laughs> great shot of young Cheryl Crow. Yes, certainly one of our so, great- Which actually leads on. me to, uh, to ask you about Eric Clapp. Okay, yeah, I do have an interesting story about Eric Clapton, um, which is in my book, Rock and Roll Lens, Volume One. So the first time I photographed Eric Clapton was back in the 80s. And um, I brought with me to the show, uh, one of the models that I had been photographing in Minneapolis. There's a lot of uh, fashion and, and uh, in, the, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, a lot of professional mm -hmm. models. And I had worked with one beautiful girl and I said, hey, do you want to go see Eric Clapton? And she said, okay. So we're driving to the concert, okay? And we're about halfway to the show and she says to me, oh, I'm so excited. I just love Tom Petty. And I said, <laughs> we're going to see Eric Clapton. She says, not Tom Petty, Eric Clapton, same thing. So I realized wow. that, you know, that mm. she's younger. She yeah. didn't know who Eric Clapton was. I just couldn't believe it. So as we're driving to the show, I'm, you know, giving our little history. And there was a band back in the 60s called Cream and the, and, you know, the Yardbirds and this and that. And mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, we get to the show. Uh, I, uh, we had very good seats. I don't know, a fifth row or something. And of course, I get to photograph the opening of the show. I photograph it and I get back to my seat to just watch and enjoy the show. And uh, the girl's name was Jean and she's gone. She's not there. Where is she? So, you know, people are standing and screaming through the whole show and the concert's terrific. And meanwhile, I, you know, I figure, well, I don't know what happened. The show ends, everybody leaves the arena. I'm standing there alone. And I, I'm only gonna stay here a few more minutes. I'm gonna split, this is ridiculous. And out comes Gene from backstage, from backstage. <laughs> well, it turns out during the show, uh, she had, maybe when I came back to our seat, she kind of went to the front uh, the front of the front row and she was dancing and she had a cute outfit on and she got backstage passes and she says here Jimmy here's your backstage pass so I didn't even have a backstage pass without Jean so uh, <laughs> to make a long story short it was Jean who introduced me to Eric Clapton huh. that's that's a wild story that's fun. My favorite story. that's fun though mm -hmm. those were the days huh yeah, and behind me, <laughs> yeah. maybe you can see it. There's a picture. I don't know how you can, well, you can see it. And it's my photo from that night. Ah. And, and Eric signed it. Mm. <laughs> Years later, I was able to get it to him and he autographed it for me. So, uh, hooray. That's nice. Yeah. So I understand you have a pretty good George Thorogood story, Greg. I, I, I think it's like a, a fun little cute story. My oh. son went to uh, the same school that his daughter went to. Uh -huh. And so one day we were out and um, up at the Glen Center there, Jimmy. And um, mm -hmm. my son was really young at the time. He must, he, he might've been like, I don't know, like 11, 10 or 11. And he loved Bad to the Bone. So I had bought him the record, right? So he knew Bad to the Bone. Ah. He recognized, he saw George Thorogood walking towards him up at the Glen Center. Mm -hmm. And he says, hey, I know you, you're famous. <laughs> and you know, he kind of gave him a little rub on the head. And you know, he said, I love your song, Bad to the Bone. So then we'd see them at school and kind of got, you know, just a little bit friendly and, 
And so one day I'm standing in Starbucks. This is like, you know, maybe months later, I'm standing in Starbucks waiting for my coffee and my son's next to me. And George Thorogood kind of walks through the door like a video, you know, <laughs> and he walks in Starbucks and he looks forward and sees my son. And he says, hey, Waylon, what do you have to say for yourself, kid? <laughs> and it was like, right, he's, he's, he doesn't want to talk to me. He's like, kid, you know, what are you doing, Waylon? You know, it's just like, you know, after seeing like the bad to the bone video where he's playing pool with Bo Diddley, you know, to cut part part yeah. starbucks you know the, the the reality of life you know it's at starbucks <laughs> you saying hi to the kid from school it's a much more tame existence you know, yeah. than the rock and roll <laughs> than the rock and roll sort of video <laughs> image you know but he's a great guy and obviously a real talent and he's just a sweetheart of a guy um you mm. know always uh always had a you know great feeling about him when we'd run into him just he gets it and as I recall, a, a very good baseball player, I think, early in his life or career. Oh, interesting. Um, this, this picture of George um, was one of the earliest photographs that I ever took. Mm. Uh, remember I told you I started out taking photos only at outdoor concerts, you know, yes. match with sunlight. Mm. And this was one of those outdoor shows. Um, and this was my very first picture ever published in a national magazine. It was published in a new magazine, new at that time, called Spin magazine sure. spin had only been out for a few months and um i i was with spin for quite a while and so that yeah. picture was very special to me because it was my first uh, picture in a national magazine and that picture too is in uh, uh, my book rock and roll lens volume one it's very cool right greg contributed so as you know as he talked about earlier to rock and roll lens volume two mm -hmm. and he was one greg was one of 50 people in the music industry to write stories in that book. And um, I, I appreciate that, Greg, and, and also the other stories that people told. Uh, by the way, Greg mentioned the great Wadi Wachtel, mm -hmm. the great mm. uh, guitar player for so many artists, so many albums. And Wadi, in, the, in this book, Rock and Roll Lens Volume 2, he tells a story about Frank Sinatra that's just hysterical, very funny story. <laughs> About Frank Sinatra. Yeah. Was, um, I photographed Frank, I think maybe four times. Yeah. Which was quite mm. an honor. I know the punchline of that story if you want it. <laughs> Let's hear it. That Waddy was in the hallway at the studio and he has, you know, he looks, you know, he's got the long hair that he still has, right? This is years ago. And he looks down, he sees Frank Sinatra in the hallway. And Frank looks over at the bodyguard and stops him and says, Looks, he looks over at Wadi and he says, I think we were at the wrong session. <laughs> you know, he's like this long haired rock and roll guy. He's like, I'm, I'm in the wrong studio. This isn't, this isn't my, this isn't my gig. Uh, we must be in the wrong place. <laughs> Looking at Wadi's long exactly. rocks, you know, very funny. Wow. Yeah. Oh, was that Capital Studio B? <laughs> you know? We'll, we'll never know. I know that I know that there were a lot of people that recorded at that studio. Right. Yeah, um, it could have been there, right? Or or what? what maybe Ocean Way or something, mm -hmm. or the, you know mm -hmm. Conway, which is now East West. You know, I think they still have his podium in in, in the big. Ah. Could have been one of those, probably. Uh, <laughs> Great. Okay, Jimmy, you, you've recently had a pretty nifty honor, mm. which is to be one of Los Angeles's hundred most interesting people. Well, thank you very much. That was a recognition by the um, Best of Los Angeles Awards, uh, which um, is, is a really cool group. Uh, people who want to know more about it, just go to Facebook and uh, search for Best of Los Angeles Awards. And um, it's a, a group on Facebook that recognizes apparently interesting people here in Los Angeles uh, from all walks of life, all professions, certainly many in entertainment. And so that was a, a nice honor to receive being well, part of that. Congratulations. I've never known, I never thought I would know one of the hundred most interesting. People yeah, there's a lot of people, so a hundred is really not that many, Jimmy. 
<laughs> right. That's, yeah, that's that's kind of an uppercut, you know. <laughs> yeah. And you're like one of the most you're one of the 100 most interesting people out of like 7 million. Yeah, know? right. <laughs> like could just be like that beer guy and be the most interesting <laughs> man in the world. Like the Dos Equis man. Yes, the Dos Equis man. Right. Um, that'll be my next goal. Um, can I mention um, this little movie that I made recently? This is another thing Greg and I have in common. Mm. Uh, he's making, of course, some very important uh, films. Uh, and he mentioned this wonderful documentary he's working on now. And of course, he uh, is very learned in filmmaking, having uh, gone to school and uh, studied that. Mm. Uh, but I have a little short film that I'd uh, love to invite your viewers to check out. And all they need to do is go to Troma Now and search for my film called Serum. Mm. And um, it's a film I made all about our current uh, uh, pandemic. Mm. Um, it has a fun little twist that I think people will really enjoy. It's a short film. And uh, I'm proud to say I directed it and acted in it. Ah. Serum on Troma Very Now. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. And you are working on a, is it a book about Alfred Hitchcock? I am. Um, I know that you, you love interviewing directors and you also have loved interviewing photographers and all those articles are on the Hollywood Times spot today. Yes, I, I oh. guess maybe since I was a child, I always wanted to be Johnny Carson. I wanted to interview people, right? Ended up behind the camera, not in front of the camera for the most part. Uh, but uh, it's true, I have for the last five or so years, maybe 10 years now, I've been interviewing uh, first um, legendary photographers. Uh, I can relate to them, of course, being a photographer, we have a lot to talk about, a lot in common, and it's been an yes. honor that the list is too long, but if viewers want to go to the Hollywood Times dot today and just search my name, frankly, Jimmy Steinfeld, you'll see all the interviews that I'm so proud of, of uh, truly some of the world's uh, most famous photographers. But that also led me to realize, hey, I'm, I'm pretty good at interviewing people now. I've, I've gotten good at it and I've always loved movies and specifically my favorite director, Alfred Hitchcock. So mm -hmm. about three years ago, I decided I'm going to interview every legendary director that I can get a hold of, <laughs> specifically about how they were influenced by the great Alfred Hitchcock. And it's going very uh -huh. well. Mm -hmm. um, I've interviewed, just off the top of my head, Mel Brooks, Peter Bogdanovich, Mark Rydell, um, uh, other, many others. It's two, oh, Norman Lloyd, who's 105 years old wow. and uh, co-produced all of the Alfred Hitchcock TV shows, all those legendary television shows. Wow. And uh, I still need to gather additional interviews with other legendary directors. Um, but who do uh, you need? Oh, some of the gets that I'd like. Yes. Yeah. Well, of course. Uh, Scorsese is uh, very high on my list ah. because uh, he has made it very clear how uh, much influence he was by Hitchcock and, and all the legendary uh, cats that are still with us. Uh, of course, Spielberg, uh, two guys from my hometown, uh, the Coen brothers, uh, again, the, the Minnesota. Ah. Legend, um, and uh, a very long list, really. A, any of the legendary directors, William Friedkin is, an, is a director I've always loved. Mm. and um, Coppola and um, uh, George Lucas. So I'm working on this book. It's called Hitchcock Shadow, Conversation ah. with the Great Directors. And um, I'm making progress. So I'm very glad that you asked me about that. And it's been a really exciting and terrific uh, to interview uh, these legendary directors. That's wow. wonderful. I can't wait for that one. And I'm honored you're interviewing me. I mean, <laughs> I'm the interviewer. I'm doing, I'm doing my best. <laughs> wow, very good. Susan, very well. And you are also working on a film. The pandemic seems to have 
had a lot of creativity bubbling up within the artistic community. Why don't you tell us about that, Greg? Yeah, um, I am in the process of producing the follow-up to Denny Tedesco's award-winning music documentary, The Wrecking Crew, which uh, chronicled the famous 60s session musicians that played yes. with everyone, right? Um, you know, Carol, Carol Kay, um, Hal Blaine, um, Plaz Johnson, you know, just all, you know, uh, and then Denny's father, the a great late guitarist, uh, Tommy Tedesco. Um, so mm. he did that wonderful documentary um, on, on those musicians in that era. And I approached Denny um, earlier in the year about doing the follow-up. I said, you know, what about, you know, taking it into the seventies and doing, as we noted earlier, the Waddy Wattels and the Jim Keltners and the, you know, Russ Kunkel, Lee Sklar, Danny Korchmar, um, Craig Durge, David Lindley, you know, that, that 70s mm -hmm. group of, uh, you know, players that kind of punctuated the singer songwriter era, you know, all of the, you know, so we we're about 75% done with the documentary at this point. I think we probably got about 20 interviews done and we're starting a rough assembly right now, but we we've interviewed we have about an hour to two hours each with Carol King, Linda Ronstadt, um, Jackson Brown, James Taylor, um, wow. Phil Collins, Billy Bob Thornton, um, producer Russ Teitelman, record exec Lenny Warnker, Peter Asher, um, mm -hmm. and then of course all the subjects, you know, all the session musicians themselves. Um, right. We've gone to New York and filmed them playing live at the Iridium. We've uh. We've done a, a whole a host of you know great things with these guys and and all of these interviewees and um, it's just been an amazing experience to you know sort of take the wheel along with Denny and help tell the story of these incredible players who really never fell out of fashion and I think that's what really kind of separates this documentary from even the Wrecking Crew is that right. the Wrecking Crew never left very rarely left their seat in the studio they I think back in the day, it was, you know, the fear that they'd be replaced and, you know, lose their work. <laughs> the thing that's sort of interesting about the players that I mentioned in the forthcoming documentary um, is that, you know, these guys not only played on the records of these artists, but they also went on the road and toured with them. Um, and, you know, they never really fell out of fashion. They're still first call session players today. Um, right. Them, is, yeah. is there anyone you're looking for? Uh, <laughs> you know, in all honesty, um, I, I, this is a little different. I will tell you that, you know, uh, all of our subjects are alive and well, and so revered and loved by everyone that has worked with them. Um, and, and also by the people that are influenced by them that, um, every single person we've asked to be interviewed has said, yes, there's not one person yet who, who declined. Um, nice. For me, it's just scheduling the, the remainder of the, maybe the last quarter of the interviews, but I right. sort of already have those firmed up. So um, I think we're good there. We're kind of getting into the realm of we really have enough right now, but you know. You have a distributor yet? You know, we are looking right now, you know, we've done a lot of, uh, we've had a lot of meetings, but you know, a lot of people are, you know, they kind of wait for the rough cut on stuff like this, you know? Yeah. Um, we have a lot of interest though, from various avenues as, as you can imagine, right. given the subject matter, um, mm -hmm. given, you know, the guests, uh, the level of, of stardom, you know, with the guests and, and, right. uh, and not to mention the fact that, you know, it's a, the music documentary is a proven, a winner out there, you know, with 20 Feet from Stardom and sure. uh, Laurel Canyon and the David right. Crosby doc and the Linda Ronstadt doc. So uh, we're kind of, you know, looking around to see who we feel sort of the best um, to, to partner with, especially given COVID and not knowing where we're at with theatrical sure. people and all of that, you know, it's, there's a lot to consider, but. Right. Um, before this photo, well, it just went away, but I, I, you know, Jimmy, you, you have definitely photographed a different side of Dolly Parton. <laughs> right. Well, I figured that uh, 
people have been concentrating on her front for so long. Right. <laughs> it was about time uh, someone uh, covered the derriere, if you'll pardon the expression. And um, in uh, actually, I think Dolly is the only person who appears twice in my first book, Rock and Roll Lens, Volume ah. Two. Uh, and it's she appears when you open the pages, she's on both sides of the page. One is a beautiful picture of her from the front, and one is the picture you just showed of her from behind <laughs> in her rhinestone <laughs> sexy outfit. But With you know it's her, and you know. Yes, <laughs> you're right, Greg. You yes. know who it is, even from uh, the rear. That's uh, right. So, and uh, it's really the hair more than the rear. The hair. Yeah. Yes. Yes. She's also got uh, super long, the famous super long fingernails. Anyway, yeah. um, thank you for, I, Susan, I know you like that picture and many people uh, like that picture. Um, well, it's just, it's something that it, it, to me that takes a very special talent to do that, you know, to go against the grain and, and do something completely different. So uh, I applaud you that, you know. Uh, well, yeah. That's not why, only, right, that's why I, you're one of Los Angeles's, one of Los Angeles's most interesting hundred people. Thank <laughs> sure. you. I guess I did have to think, number one, to take the picture in the first place, and then also yeah. put, it, put it in the book. I mean, I, there's only 50 pictures of the, right. you know, the half a million pictures I've taken. There's only 50 well, pictures in that first book, and that's and that's one of them. I want to interject real quick before I forget, though. Greg mentioned um, one of the people in his forthcoming film is Leland Sklar, and Leland wrote one of the stories in my book, Rock and Roll Lens, Volume 2. Ah. So Greg's in that book, Leland's in that book, Wadi is in that book. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, all roads uh, lead to... Uh, uh, the 70s rock and roll scene. And, uh, That's right. And, and the main road leads to jimmysteinfeld.com where you can oh, order the books. <laughs> right. I hope, I hope uh, our listeners do. You know, are, are we looking at Frank and Sammy? Yes, we are. Okay. Well, I photographed Frank Sinatra, I think, four times, including at his 80th birthday party. I'll never forget oh. that. Mm. But this, I think, was the first time I photographed him um, and this was the Rat Pack tour. Mm. And um, it was uh, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr. And it was supposed to be Dean Martin, who was one of my all time favorite singers. But he yeah. decided at the last minute to pull out of that tour. And I never got to see him or photograph him, but Aww. I did get to photograph. Uh, I took that uh, photo that I love so much of Frank and Sammy, two of the greatest entertainers that ever lived. Mm. Mm. Most definitely. Ah, wow. Okay, so what's next on the horizon for you aside from finishing Alfred Hitchcock? Oh, yeah. Well, of course, I continue to do rock and roll photography. There's no shows right now for obvious reasons. Right. But artists are still uh, writing and recording, and they will need photography for uh, their uh, recordings, even though we don't have, uh, by the way, this book is 12 by 12 inches, and that was designed and square, obviously, and designed in that on uh, purpose as a uh, uh, an ode to the album. Mm -hmm. So, uh, although people are putting things out now on occasion on vinyl, um, obviously most uh, purchases are now made online. But anyway, right. the point is, artists do need uh, photography um, when they put out uh, new songs. An album. Yes. And so I continue to do that both in the studio and on location. And um, I look forward to continuing to do that. And then one day when we're able to go and see live concerts and hear great musicians, including bass players, such as <laughs> our guest, Greg, um, I look forward to uh, being, uh, if you will, back on the road, photographing uh, great concerts and our great entertainers. So where would you like, where's the, your favorite place to shoot a concert? Well, that's a very good question. I would say in Los Angeles, it's probably the Troubadour. Uh, the ah. Troubadour is small and intimate. 
Uh, the yes. chip store has a, a balcony, which is a low balcony. So you can just get the most magnificent picture of the whole band. Mm. Uh, that <coughs> um, I, and back in my hometown in Minneapolis, um, I love First Avenue, a very famous a club where sort of helped launch Prince's career and, and a lot right. of bands that came from there. I'll drop a few names, The Replacements, Husker Du, Soul Asylum, The Jayhawks. I mean, I could go on and on about my hometown. But First Avenue uh, is a great club. Uh, it's certainly bigger than the Troubadour. It's like a miniature Palladium. There's a mm. balcony uh, that wraps around uh, almost uh, the whole club. So you can get great photos from above, but it's also laid up, laid out in such a way that you can get wonderful close-ups. Uh, it's a relatively intimate club, First Avenue. It's an old mm. bus station. It was a Greyhound bus depot. And they converted it into yeah. a, uh, uh, my friend, Alan Fingerhut, uh, uh, did that back in the 70s. And um, anyway, uh, other places in Los Angeles, of course, I've been here now 25 years, that I love would be, uh, well, I mentioned the Palladium, uh, yes. and of course the Viper Room. Uh, mm. When I first got here, the Dragonfly, I was there a lot. Uh, huh? And the large venues, such as uh, the larger venues, such as uh, the Wiltern and the Pantages, um, and, uh, and also uh, the Great. Staples Center. But I remember photographing a show at the Staples Center, and it was raining. Inside the Staples Center, it was raining. That was <laughs> That was that was Britney Spears show, and I, I still honestly don't know how everybody doesn't get electrocuted. But maybe Greg knows. He's uh, uh, done a lot of cool uh, touring uh, tricks. We stayed away from water and all of that. We were <laughs> okay, but here it was in the show. I mean, I, I don't know how it was done, but um, that was at a, of course, a big, beautiful venue, the Staples Center. Wow. So there's a lot of ways and places to see concerts, and I. I know I'm speaking for Greg and me and everybody. We look forward to the day we can go back and see live music and, and right. participate. What about out of the United States? Well, yes, I photographed uh, Aerosmith and Ziggy Marley at the Zenit in uh, Paris. And um, I, I've done photography in London. I forget the venues there. Mm. Um, that's always uh, extra fun and exciting to, to photograph. Shepherd um, Bush Empire is a great venue, and uh, okay. I got I got to get there one day. Oh, it's All fantastic! Right. Yeah, I, I remember playing there. It was great. So, are the Wallflowers planning on going back on tour when they are able? Well, you know, I'm not sure what their plans are. As I think I mentioned maybe before, that I was in the band from 1993 to 2013, and then ah. I, I quit the band to, you know, go back in kind of get into the film thing, which, you know, I had gone to school for before I actually joined the band. Right, so I didn't great. realize you'd been away from them for so long. Oh, okay, yeah. that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's, you know, we packed a lot in those 20 years and I kind of felt like, uh, you know, I, I was really wanting to get in on, on the producing side on, on film yeah. and TV so that, you know, I basically started a production company with an old friend of mine and, nice. you know, we've got a slate of documentaries and a, a couple features that are about ready to, to be shopped and then uh you know a few well, uh, music things definitely have your house photographer i certainly <laughs> do that's covered we know who that is but, so uh, there yeah. will be other books right there will be other books but this will be this will be film that's <laughs> film right lens. that's right we need a still photographer on a lot of these sessions, so you know, and a lot of documentary these, uh, lens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Jimmy, up for it? Absolutely. Fantastic. Tell me, just tell me the day and time, and I'll be there. All right. All right. Wow. With, with a mask, if necessary. Of course. <laughs> for the time being, it is. <laughs> okay. This has been just really special. Thank you so so very much. It was fun. For uh, spending time with us at Hollywood Times Live. I know you've been a, uh, a, a recipient of the Snazzy Award. And yeah, I've got it right here. The Hollywood Times Hollywood for Times quite News. a while. Wow. And uh, 
you know, so at the award, the accolades just keep on coming. So keep doing what you're doing. And, uh, you know, Greg, congratulations. I'm, I'm really happy you're doing, you know, another part of what you like to do. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no, this has been a lot of fun. It's been a good shift for me and excellent. Enjoying it. Well, we've got, don't forget, go to jimmysteinfeld.com. If you need to watch this over to find out what galleries his prints are at, by all means do that. Or just head on over to jimmysteinfeld.com. That's where you can get the books. You can see the prints. You can special order them. You know, one-stop shopping at jimmysteinfeld.com. Thanks, Susan. Better than Amazon. And thank you, Greg, very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me yes. today. I appreciate it. Greg, it's anytime been I can wonderful. support Jimmy, I'm I'm down for the cause. He's uh, he's a he's a serious talent, and, uh, and his books are great, and his, his photography is incredible. And, but most importantly, we're good friends, and you know, I cherish that. It is all about relationships. It is, isn't it? And and the older we get, the mo- the more important those relationships become. That's right. <laughs> I look at it as I just, I have a, a, you know, a handful of friends that I really, really love and they just happen to be very talented. So, you know. Yes. Back at you, back at you. I understand. Well, thank you again. We've got some really exciting things coming up here at the Hollywood Times Live. So uh, stay tuned and um, we'll see you on the downside. Excellent. Thank you for watching and suggest you subscribe to this channel for the next Hollywood Times Live.